Welcome, friends, to this second and final day of our two-day event here in Dubai, UAE. I am very happy to see all of you again. I have come about 10 minutes late today. I am sorry for that, but when I get late to a meeting, I tell a story. <laughs> so I am going to tell you that story. In the United States, big cities like Chicago or New York, Big companies, retail stores like Walmart and others, they have been hiring some retired people to function and work as greeters on their entrance. It has worked very successfully. These retired people, they are very experienced people, they are very kind. They have not joined the jobs for any salary or something, just to keep themselves occupied. They have had their own pensions, they are all working well. But to keep occupied, the senior older people are being hired and they like to do the job. One Walmart store in Chicago hired a retired man. He was very nice. He greeted people so courteously, the sales of Walmart went up. But every day he came 10 or 15 minutes late. So the manager once asked him, you are such a nice man, every day you come 10 or 15 minutes late, what would the people in your office say where you were working earlier if you came 10, 15 minutes late? So the retired man hung his face down and said, they would say, good morning Admiral, shall we bring your coffee now? That's the old story which I tell when I get 10 minutes late. I have explained to you the purpose of my visit and sharing this information with you. The purpose is that the statement made in the Bible and elsewhere, seek and ye shall find, holds true even today. The secret of discovering who you are the secret of discovering why this universe has come into being, the secret of finding out where we belong really, the secret of finding out what is our soul, all these are within us and the starting point for discovering all that is to seek within yourself, period. If you don't seek, you won't find. If you seek, you will find. Therefore. The seeking comes from inside. It is not a mental curiosity. And some people out of mental curiosity say, why are so many people gathering here? Something must be going on. Is it a good food they are serving? Or is it some other function going on? Maybe it's a nice uh, wedding party. We can crash in and see. But they are not seekers. But the truth can be found only if you seek within yourself. Seek and ye shall find. So the seeking is the first secret. Seeking does not mean that you have to shout anywhere in the street. Seeking has to be done in your own heart. This world is so made up that when you seek in your own heart, that which, that which is within you comes in front. Since we don't look inside, though we seek inside, what comes inside appears outside. When we are ready, and we are seeking inside and we don't know how to look inside, a human being appears in our life outside at the right time and we don't know how he has appeared. It's a coincidence very often, by chance we meet somebody and that human being then becomes a friend of ours and there is a pull in the love of that human being which, he, which we feel and that works to bring us closer in friendship. We have many friends in this world. Those friendships do not last very long. You have yourself seen, we have made so many friends, especially older people like me have made so many friends, they have come and gone. So, but there is one friendship that never goes away. That's the friendship that comes when you are seeking for something inside and a human being appears outside in response to your seeking and pulls you with a love and a friendship that never goes away. It's a permanent, eternal friendship. There's very, very unusual kind of friendship. We don't see it at immediately. Over time, we discover this friendship is different. 
because in this friendship there is no judgment involved they are not saying you be good then i'll be a friend you do like this then i'll be a friend there are no condition attached at all this friendship is as if we have known each other for a long time when we come across such a person a strange feeling comes that we have known this person for a long time and we like to share our own problems which we have never been able to share with other friends suddenly with a new friend whom we don't know too well we want to share those problems we want to share our life with that person and become very strange to our to our own self why are we sharing so much with somebody we have just come to know because friendship that is made by thinking about it is a mental friendship but a friendship that does not come by thinking but comes by chance by coincidence is spiritual friendship so spiritual friendship comes when we are seekers and this spiritual friendship with such a human being is the key to go to our true home such a human being ordinary human being like ourselves born like us lives like us dies like us falls sick like us eats food like us does exactly like us he becomes like us he is like us and yet he is a key figure in our journey to our true home back within ourselves how does that happen how can such a person come because such a person like everything else in this world is being created with our own consciousness this whole experience we are having of this world we think the world existed first then we are having experience of it the truth is the exact opposite we are experiencing it therefore the world is existing supposing we were not experiencing there will be no world and all the experiences we having of this world is through our sense perceptions so sense perceptions are creating our world we don't know whether the causal effect is the world has to come first and then we see it or we see it and therefore there is a world very old question philosophers have been debating for thousands of years they say when we see a tree the tree is there because we are seeing it or we are seeing it because it's already there we all believe a world has to exist before we can see it therefore we have put the created universes ahead of our own experiences we have said even if we were not here the world would still be here many people we see have gone away died the world is still here so all the evidence in front of us says that the world is real we have come temporarily to see it the mystics say no that is not true you come here and because you have the experience of the world therefore the world exists and only that much of the world exists which you are experiencing beyond that we don't know they take the example of his little insect crawling his whole world is that he does not know there are planes flying outside he does not know that there are human beings living here therefore the insect the life is like that for other forms of life life is limited to their sense perceptions so is the life of a human being therefore it for true perception through sense perceptions we are coming to know there is a world around us now this is a good question if you look at a tree is your looking at the tree creating the tree or the tree is actually there and therefore you are looking at it most people will answer tree has to be there why you have to bring a tree in front then you see it if you remove the tree then you can't see it but the one who brings the tree is also part of the experience of seeing therefore you can't have a final answer by saying that somebody brings is also part of the seeing of the tree or seeing of somebody bringing the tree now we are all trained our minds are trained in believing in cause and effect that there has to be a cause for every effect then we can study is the seeing the cause that creates the tree or the tree is the cause and we see it is the effect the answer is whatever comes first will be the cause whatever comes later is the effect but when we examine when does the tree come when we see it they are both simultaneous 
no time lag at all between the two. The seeing of the tree and the tree are simultaneous. There is no time lag, therefore we cannot determine the cause. Therefore we have to go with our experience and belief. But if you meditate and go within and discover the nature of creation, you will discover the whole thing has been created from within our own consciousness. That's the only way you can find out with certainty that it is the whole creation is taking place because we are conscious beings and the consciousness creates everything. That's a very big discovery. It changes our whole attitude toward life, changes our attitude toward this world just by that discovery. That can be found through meditation within ourselves. So that is why if you are interested in knowing the nature of creation, how it has come, how we are looking so different, why so many different people have been created, what causes differences in our appearances, in our languages, in our culture, all the answers to these questions are lying inside us. As I explained yesterday, there are two parts of this process of going within. One is a mental process and one is a spiritual process. The mental process takes us through the fields, through the areas of experiences which are in space and time, which is created by the mind. This physical universe is the first place where we are here, we have been talking, because from here we have to find, start finding it. It's in this world, in the physical world, that a human being appears whom we call a perfect living master. Who is talking to us as a perfect living master in a human form with awareness of all the reality right up to his true home 24-7. He does not have to remember what he saw, he's seeing when he talks to us. That is a very big difference between that experience of knowing and seeing something and then telling us instead of remembering something and telling us. Such a human being then tells us the mental process which is a very simple to withdraw your attention from what is outside to something that is inside. We are not used to it. We are all used to putting our attention outside. We hear the phrase, focus your attention. Every time we focus attention, we are outside. To focus attention, we always look out. Now if somebody says focus attention inside, we don't know how to do it. Nobody knows how you can focus attention on your own self because the focusing of attention is an exercise that takes your attention outside to some point where you are focusing. Therefore, there is a very big difference between focusing attention, which many people think is meditation, and withdrawing attention to yourself. Secret is withdrawing attention, not focusing attention. When we try to meditate by focusing attention on something, we are away from ourselves. No matter what you are focusing on, whether you are focusing on some spot you are looking inside, or you're focusing on a point you've made outside, or an image you've created of your deity or god or gods or something to worship outside, you are outside, not going inside at all. That is why withdrawing of attention we have never practiced. We have always practiced how to put attention outside on things and we call it focusing attention. So therefore withdrawing attention is a new exercise. That is why some of us take some time to learn how to withdraw attention. I gave you an example how my great master, he taught me how to imagine that the whole of me is lifted up, up there. Not I am going to make a picture of myself and see. I was making a picture of myself before that. When he said that is not correct, because you are focusing attention on image you are creating. Therefore he said withdraw attention, think you are yourself moved up there. You can't see yourself. Nobody has ever seen their own eyes except a reflection in the mirror. The eyes that see cannot be seen by us because that's from where we see. Therefore, if even when you close your eyes, you cannot see where your eyes are. If you are able to see somebody with eyes, that's not you. You are the one who is seeing that image. That is why withdrawal of attention is a secret. True meditation consists of withdrawing your attention from outside and imagining you are already there, not looking at yourself. You're imagining you are there looking at things from inside, 
not from outside. This needs a little practice and when you can practice withdrawing of attention, it becomes very easy the rest of the exercise to lose your awareness of the physical body. I have seen people dying. So many of my colleagues have died. My friends have died who were with me in college, in service with me. And when I've seen them, some dying terminally in their hospitals, in hospices, I've seen them. They are dying gradually. First, they don't know where their limbs have gone. They are saying to the nurse, please uh, move my leg to the left side. Le leg is already on the left side. They have no idea what is happening to the legs and the arms. Then they don't know what is happening to their bottom. Am I floating? I am seeing myself floating. You are not floating, just lose the awareness of your bottom. Then you don't know, you can't speak, and the eyes are still moving, and then your brain dead, you are dead. If you practice putting attention on withdrawal to yourself behind the eyes in this very body, you have the same experience. That means you can have a total experience which you will have when this body dies, have it right now. It's a very, very useful exercise. Because many people, most people, are afraid of death. And when this experience takes place, death goes away. The fear of death goes away. It's not death at all. You find that it's not death. You are still more alive than you are alive in the physical body. Because so your sense perceptions become much stronger. They work independently without filtering through the organs of the body. And they function uh, with your, what we call imagination. Imagination is not that imaginary as we think. It looks imaginary only when we think this world is real, therefore that is imaginary. If this world is not in our awareness, that does not remain imaginary, it remains absolutely real. And the power of creating things through imagination becomes the great reality of experience. This happens when you can withdraw your attention and do everything inside. Meditation is not a chore that you are trying to sit somewhere very sternly, trying to stay focused somewhere. That's very tiring. And there's not a, we are not really putting the attention where it's needed. Attention should be on your own self inside. I remember a disciple of one of the masters whom I knew lived in San Francisco many years ago. He invited me to come and stay with him for a few days. I accepted his invitation and I went to San Francisco from India. I was very tired. He said, oh, Ishwar, you are old disciple of great master. We are going to do meditation at three o'clock in the morning. I was really thinking I'll have a good night's sleep. But to keep up my face, yes, yes, I am a great disciple. I agreed. Some ego plays a part that all right, show off that you can, you can also meditate with them. By the alarm, he got up, three o'clock, I also got up. And we cross-legged, sat on the floor and closed our eyes. And he said, we will meditate strictly according to the rules, two and a half hours. That frightened me a little. But I said, all right, I'll also try. It's a good day for me to try two and a half hours. I hadn't done that much for a long time. So there we sit, out of curiosity, I would sometimes open my eye, right eye, to look what he was doing. I don't know if it was a coincidence or what happened. Every time I looked, he was looking at his watch like this. <laughs> I don't know whether he was looking all the time or what, but every time I checked, I would see him. <laughs> Two and a half hours are not easy to pass. You have to look at the watch many times. It looks like 10 hours when you meditate like that. Terrible way of meditating. As you don't feel like meditating, you're forcing yourself to meditate. Two and a half hours passed. I was a little amused. That made the time run a little faster. By looking at this event, after that he said, Ishwar, what a wonderful meditation we had, complete two and a half hours. I said, it was very good meditation, my friend. Only thing is, instead of meditating on your own self, you meditated on your watch. I said, when you looked at the watch, it was not one second that you looked. 
You are waiting when to see it again. That is why you are going on looking. Your whole meditation was on the watch. How can you find your own self when the meditation is on the watch? We who have been initiated by masters for so long have been doing something boring, hardly worth it. When I conduct my meditation workshops so that people can actually meditate with me, I tell them, have a good time here, have a party inside, invite your friends inside, have a great party, they enjoy it, not outside, in the space behind the eyes, inside. The meditation becomes so great. I say, invite your master, have a cup of tea, coffee with the master. Then they say, is that meditation? I say, that's real meditation. You are drawing your attention inside. Don't make it into ritual or something. Don't make it religion. Spirituality is not religion. Spirituality is to find the spirit, who you are. Therefore, enjoy your meditation. After one or two sessions, they all start enjoying. They don't want to stop. I have to count five to make them stop. That is what meditation means. A withdrawal to our own self, where we are operating from as waking human beings. That is from the head, behind the eyes, and that's the right spot to start. Just by concentrating your attention there, you can have this experience. Even if you have no mantra with you, no simran with you, no words with you, just activities at the center, behind the eyes, will draw your, will draw your attention to the third eye center. So that's the beginning. It's very important to have the correct start if you start in the wrong direction, you can never reach the destination. Therefore, the start is very important. And I mentioned yesterday that you should practice being there before you do any other kind of meditation practice, like repeating your mantra or repeating your simran or doing, repeating your words, which also serve a purpose in trying to bring the mind inside. These actions in meditation of withdrawing your attention inside are, can be done by controlling our mind. Nothing else stops us from enjoying it, uh, time inside except the mind thinking of things outside. That's the only distraction. People say, we can't control our mind, it's very difficult. The harder we try, the more difficult it becomes. It does. We have given so much power to our own minds. We are supposed to keep the power in our hands, in the soul, and use the mind. We have given all the power to the mind to decide our life. Mind is telling us, thoughts are telling us what to do every day. What is putting a cart before the horse, that the mind should be told what to do, not mind should tell us what to do. Now, that is second most important thing, that to control the mind does not mean to stop the mind. If you stop the mind, you die. Mind thinking for the mind is like heartbeat for the body. Mind survives by thinking. Nobody stops thinking. A colleague of mine at Harvard University where I went to study, he was very interested in learning True meditation. He had his own gurus and who taught him the stillness of the mind is required. Without stillness of the mind, there should be no thought. That he was taught. So he used to practice not thinking. So I gave you an example how when he was, I called him to my uh, apartment, he was thinking so much in different channels of the mind. He thought he had stopped one channel, mind kept thinking other channels. Mind jumps from channel to channel. It has to think. You cannot stop thinking, but you can make the mind think what you wanted to think. Say, think about this thing. Think about the master. Think about the thing inside. Think what garden I'm growing inside. Think of what nice house I'm building inside. Mind will think that. Become your servant. You can control the mind that way, not by telling mind, tell us what we should do, and he'll say, go, 
Don't, don't you remember? You have some appointments tomorrow. Don't you remember? Your friends are there. Don't you know so and so is sick? You have to go and see. Everything outside. Convert this into something that's interesting, created by your imagination. It's so easy. If you had to, if I had said you have to invest a lot of money to buy something inside, would be a different thing. You can't afford it. We can all afford imagination. Therefore, we have to imagine things inside and we draw our attention. This is, is so important if you are interested in finding out what is going on inside, what is your consciousness, or how does sense perceptions work, you have to find it. This physical body is functioning with the power of the soul which gives its life. The power of thought provided by the mind, working through the brain. The power of the sense perceptions working to sense organs. And then the physical body functioning for a certain period of time, maybe 60, 80, 100, 120 years, 125 years. Somebody had said with, with the organ transplants we can live to 2,000 years, 200,000 years. They have now found out that there is a system in our cells that degenerates automatically and nobody can live beyond 135 years. They come to the conclusion, no matter how many transplants you do, the cells have a certain life, the brain cells have a certain life, the pineal gland and pituitary body, which is not replaced by anything, that dies. They are thinking of having brain transplants. They have also found if you transplant the brain of one person, another, it does not mean that the new brain has come into the same person. The brain is where you have transplanted it. The person has gone there. The person is in the head, not in the rest of the body. So these are all new things medical science is trying to investigate whether it can be done. But it's a very short period compared to billions of years we have in here. So that is why the time that we have inside is much longer than the time we have in the physical body outside. So once you are able to lose the awareness of the body, sometimes they call it vacating the body of your consciousness, when you vacate the body, your inner body becomes reality. Stage one, easiest part of the operation of the meditational process is to vacate the body and experience what you would be like if you function only with sense perceptions and mind, of course, thinking mind, and your soul, which is making it alive. Next step is a little more difficult, which is also a mental process. And, and, and needs effort. These are all requiring your effort. Now when you make an effort to go inside, meditate the way I'm suggesting, with the inner body, same thing. The inner body also has the same shape as this body. Slightly larger, they say. It fits in, but slightly, if we have our arms and hands, you can sometimes bring our other hand very close, you can feel the sensation. We know there is something there. That's the sense perception, the inner body overlaps this body and therefore it's very similar. So when we imagine things, we're doing with that same kind, same type of body. But when you meditate inside the head of the inner body, you open up something which is not like this body at all. It's completely different. Because it's the mind and the soul alone. And then first time you realize that the thinking process was also like a body, which we are wearing, and that makes it thinking. It creates time, space, thinking. All this process is cause, effect, karma, everything is being created right there. Very big experience to go, go up to that. Also can be done with effort. Some guidance and effort. There the mental processes stop. You cannot use any effort to go beyond that. And true spirituality lies beyond that. If you want to have these experiences which I've just mentioned, many masters are available, gurus are available, yogis, swamis are available, to so take it to different stages. Within these two, two big grand divisions, many have taken people. But if you are seeking to go beyond the mind, beyond this world to a true home, then a perfect living master who comes in your life by coincidence, when he'll appear in your life, he will tell you, that this is only temporary up to the point of the top of the created universes, 
three universes, the physical, astral, causal, up to the mind. But our true home lies beyond that. Our soul lies beyond that. These are all functions of the mind, powered by the soul as for life, and working through these mechanisms of sense perception and physical bodies. If to go beyond, you have to be pulled with the power of love which exists beyond the mind. And when we experience that love of a perfectly master here, it is not being experienced here. It's being experienced by the soul, same soul we'll discover when you go beyond the mind. We are experiencing it right here. It will be experienced more in the inside, even more in the causal plane. And after that, when we leave the mind behind, all so-called desires are left behind. We suddenly discover our desires of not of our soul. Soul has no desire. Soul has seeking of its true home all the time in all of us. But the mind has desires and we leave the desires and attachments created by desires back here. Very big step. That's true spirituality. True spirituality is when you can cross the mind and go to where the soul exists by itself. There is no proper description of what the soul is like. People say, my soul traveled there. Soul never travels. Soul is at one place. The experiences travel around it. Experiences created by the mind travel around it. So it's a very unique situation the truth of creation comes to your knowledge. Truth of everything comes to your knowledge when you reach that stage, which has been called the stage of Par Brahm, beyond the Brahm, beyond the mind, beyond the creative power of this universe, where the soul is experienced. There are many masters. In India, we have been using two different designations, names. We are called Sadguru and Satguru. The status originally described of a Sadhu was a Sadhu he who by Sadhana has reached the state of self-discovery. That means has reached Parabrahm. So Sadguru were those who had taken us beyond birth and death, taken us beyond reincarnation, discovered our soul, our permanent self, our immortal self. They were called Sadgurus. But Satgurus were those who went beyond from the soul to totality where we merge in the single entity, single being, single power, single creative force, totality of consciousness within which everything has been created, which is our true home. People who are masters of different levels, they have called whatever they reached as their true home. We, we can't blame them because that was their experience. It's more than the physical world. So therefore, they say that is our true home. But when you are not satisfied with that true home, that means you are looking, seeking something more. Automatically, that you find when you reach there, that even when you find your soul, if you are a seeker of true home, you will not be satisfied even discovering your soul. You like to know the ultimate truth. Where do I really belong? Where does soul come from? That question will remain in our head. And that is why the perfect living masters go through a stage which has been described as the source of all darkness. In this world, they say there is knowledge and there is lack of knowledge. There is light and there is lack of light, darkness. So they, everything that is created here must have a source somewhere higher up. The source of darkness. Everything not lit up there. Most of it is lit up. But the final stage between the soul and between our total true home is the greatest darkness that has ever been created, the source of darkness. Because here, darkness means absence of light. It, it does not mean there is real darkness. We can't experience real darkness here. It's absence of light. But creating absence of light is also with some source at the higher up. And that source lies even beyond with the discovery of the soul, beyond the power Brahm. Between the power Brahm and our true home, which we call Satchikhand, lies the greatest darkness. 
it has been described in some of the scriptures as a revolving cave bhavar gufa they is called it it's like a cave you know just a description physical description cave is dark is completely shut there is no light there but because in a cave you can go in and come out but that cave of darkness such if you go in you can neither come out nor go ahead it is going round and round the darkness moves now this is just a description in physical terms because we can't understand how darkness can be moving in a in a zero time and zero space but that's what is happening experience can tell you how it happens that darkness cannot be crossed except with the pull of a power that is beyond it a perfect living master who comes into our life when we are seekers of that ultimate truth pulls us with his love through that sometime people have described that because we can't understand what the what the experience is like what the state of being is like therefore they describe it in human terms in physical terms that this is a great darkness is evolving around if you go in you we are thrown out the doctor throws out the same way instead of taking you across and your light of a soul is equal to that of 16 physical suns put together it's a description that you yourself have got so much light of the soul and therefore even that light is very little to pierce the darkness it looks so little the darkness is so thick but the light of a perfectly we must see there is millions and trillions of suns and pierces through the darkness and pulls you through it's just a physical description of something that cannot be described so these are experiences all in store for us as human beings how lucky we are i can't imagine greater luck and fortune for a being for a soul that being trapped in a time space birth and death reincarnations for millions of years that we have an opportunity to be in a human body and just by seeking inside get all this secret is the same seeking inside the first part up to the top of the mental plane they sometimes call it the trikuti the three three portions because time has been always divided into three portions i mentioned to you that beginning middle and end have been always described brahma vishnu mahesh also a trikuti sometimes both three mountains they describe three mountains of the it's just a physical description to show time and space have been created at the mental level but the spiritual path starts beyond that those of us who are very fortunate to be seeking that perfectly we must as a peer we take our time then we sometimes are so anxious the seeking becomes so strong the love and devotion experience becomes so strong we become impatient impatience does not work because we have waited for millions of years now we say for 3 months i have been trying i haven't found it what is 3 months what is 3 lives compared to the millions of years we have been waiting for this opportunity so patience is needed for the simple rule that we are living in the world of negativity run by time events are all spread out on time it be beautiful experience for you if you go to causal plane and see how time is created first space is created after we can't even see the difference between these two right now it is first time is created at once not that they we create time slowly moving forward nothing the entire time is created and then we put ourselves in the middle what is this side past this side the future then we move on that we are now moving on that time when we move the events keep coming already placed there when the time was created space was created events were placed all of the event that we go through have been placed there therefore everything is written when we say everything is written then the process of creation is like that and all the events are placed already we move through time for time travel somebody told me you know the egyptians they had a means of traveling on time 
I said, what are we doing? Are we not traveling on time? We are doing exactly what they did, with one difference. We don't control the speed at which we travel. They control the speed. They could go a little faster or slower. And there are some universes in the physical plane where people have the control over the speed at which they travel on time. So this is just experience. So they had a little, little different experience. You can have that experience in the astral plane sitting right here. You get control over this time that you're passing. Here we have no control. Things only come on the time when the event has been fixed in advance. We travel at a fixed rate. Fixed rate determined by our clocks. It's very interesting. We believe our clocks much more than we believe ourselves. If you are sitting, having a nice party, having a nice conversation, and well, how much time has gone? Two hours? It looked like half an hour. What, which one do you believe? Half an hour or two hours? Two hours? We are slaves of the clocks now, and time is, or the watches are telling us how much time has passed. What happened to our experiences? Therefore, we are confined now, confining ourselves to calendars and watches and clocks. They tell us what time it is. A famous scientist died recently. His name was Stephen Hawking. Many of you might have heard. He had a, a very debilitating disease. He was paralyzed very early. He could not move. He, he was in a wheelchair. He only had retained the power to move his fingers a little bit. As the disease was progressive, he programmed his entire way of communication on the computer through the movement of his fingers. Therefore, he is giving talks in the voice of the computer. He has been giving lectures till the last moment before his death. So Stephen Hawking is considered to be the next great scientist after Einstein, studying space and time. Mostly he was spending his time understanding what is time. And a very big question has been raised in science. Those of you interested in this would like to know that the scientists have believed for a long time that this world that we are living in was created with a big bang. It's called the big bang. When did it happen? They calculated that when they look at the galaxies and the stars, they are all going further away from us. That means this space is expanding. So then, after the last 20 years, we see at what rate is expanding, at what rate is accelerating, apply the same thing backwards. And we go 13.6 billion years ago, it must have started. Because that's where the contraction rate goes. Just a calculation. 13.6 billion years ago, there was nothing. They call that point singularity. A singular state. Nothing was there. Neither time nor space, it all began to expand from there. Question has always been, what was there before the Big Bang? Where did the Big Bang start? Where the center from which it is expanding? They saw when we sit on the planet Earth, it's a small planet in a small solar system. Other stars are much bigger than our sun. And there are other planets we found to about 2,000 more exoplanets like ours, and these are much bigger than this. The whole system is much bigger than this How simple. Small little planet, small little solar system. And we are sitting in one corner of a galaxy we call the Milky Way galaxy. We are just sitting in one corner, observing from here, everything is moving away, further away from this point. Are we the center? Could we be the center? Then they tried, okay, let's move a few thousand miles away. At least see if that is the center. That turned out to be the center. Now put telescopes outside in space and see if that is the center. That is also the center. Which is the center? They could not determine. So they are baffled. They say the whole universe is still the center expanding. So we can't find out where the center is. A very funny statement, but science accepting it. Where the whole universe is expanding from everywhere. So everywhere is the center. Now when we come back, contract, if there was no time and space, what were there? Where did the singularity exist? 
This is the question that bothered Stephen Hawking all his life. And one month before his death, he came to a strange conclusion. And he has recorded that. He said, I find out that before this time which we are going through existed, imaginary time existed before that. And then he defines what is imaginary time. He says, imaginary time is when we are having a party and we think only two hours have passed, the clock says six hours have passed, those two hours are imaginary time that existed prior to the Big Bang. Very big statement by a physicist of that order. He says imaginary time existed prior to the physical time. Imagination is more real and was the source of creation of the Big Bang and this whole universe. Something the mystics have been saying for thousands of years. That the imagination of the astral plane is the creation, creator of this universe. The, it's very interesting for those who are interested in the correlation between science and, and spirituality. They like to study this, that how they are coming back. And the problem has arisen. Something that I predicted will arise. 60 years ago, I predicted this problem will come to the scientists. And that is that if we are expanding, we go backward, it should be a smaller and smaller universe. Now, when we have a telescope to see the universe, the telescope cannot see what is happening there today because light has to travel to come to us. The nearest star to our planet here, the nearest star, not planet, star, takes one year for the light to come to us. We look at the star in the sky, oh, there is the star, that's not the star. What we see is one year old, the nearest star. We are seeing thousands of stars every night in the sky. How far are they? Some one year, light year away, some ten light years away, some million light years away, and now we found out some billion light years away. That means we are looking at the past. If you see something, a galaxy or star, which is one billion light years away, it means it has taken a billion years for it to come to us. We are not seeing what is there now. We are seeing what is there billion years ago. They have made new telescopes which have gone to 10 billion years and now they are going to make one 13.6 billion light years. The deeper this into space and time we go into the past, the world is not contracting like it should according to Big Bear, is expanding and more and more galaxies are being found. A very big puzzle. In the next year they'll be bothered with this puzzle. How, how can this be happening? The soul of Stephen Hawking must be feeling happy that at least they're hitting into this great problem of how can there be expansion of the universe if it should be contraction in going back in the past. So he hinted before his death, he said, I am convinced this is not the only universe. There are multi-universes and there was a universe existing in which this Big Bang took place. And that, that was a very interesting thing. He also studied a phenomenon called black holes. The black holes, we don't know what is a black hole that it can take a whole universe and absorb itself. It can take millions of stars and eat them up in a small little place. Where does it hold it? The mass is so heavy. They have studied it. The mass is so heavy. Where is it eating it up? Well, maybe Gautam Buddha knew more about it. And Gautam Buddha said that everything has come out of shunni or nothing. Nothing is not empty. Nothing means everything is in it. And when nothing is emerges from something, from nothing, the whole world comes out of it. That was more than 2,000 years ago when he said that. But scientists are saying today that the black hole, when it bursts, it creates a universe. We have found two black holes in our own galaxy. And there are at least a billion black holes.
in the known universe. So we have not one universe, but billions of universes. Something mystics wrote, Vedas wrote more than 6,000 years ago. These are all recorded documents which science is thinking we are finding something great now. Is there a way for us, as seekers of the truth, to know these things? That which is real, which is not? Let me tell you the true answers can all be found within yourself. Because you find the discovery how this is being created, then nothingness is merely a description of a state of no space and time. The whole universe has been created from no space and time. If I describe it, it looks very funny. I'll say, I saw a huge mansion. It's so huge, it can fit the whole universe, this planet and everything into it. I saw a big mansion and its size was zero inches and existed in zero time. Mind can never understand. Can you imagine you can experience it? Insight. Mind is very limited capacity to know these things. But your soul's capacity is unlimited. And you can have awareness of things which the mind can never even imagine. All inside. Imagine what kind of journey is it to find things inside ourselves. The most curious people will be satisfied by having a short trip inside. So there are I call them peripheral benefits. The main objective is that we can find our true home from where everything came. We can find that through seeking. Not meditation. Meditation can take you halfway. Seeking beyond meditation. A perfect Vibhya Master comes into our life when we are seekers beyond, beyond the three worlds of time and space. I have shared these things with you Simple methods, simple tips that I have given, they are easy for a spiritual person to follow. There is no problem, only the mind is too attached outside. They say you should be detached. All the scripture says you have to have a detachment from this world before you go in. The attachment is pulling you back again and again. Reincarnation is merely a result of attachments. If you were not attached, you would not have to come back. As you are attached to so many things here, you come back again and again. Therefore, they say, practice, practice detachment. I have never seen a single person in my life who has practiced detachment. The more they try to detach, the more attached they get. That's the nature of our mind. You say, I don't want that, it'll come more and more. These, some of these yogis and swamis I saw in the mountains in Himalayas, I was posted there. There was a district in India which stretched right up to Tibet border. I happened to be appointed there. And I traveled all in the forest and saw so many swamis, yogis practicing. And I said, why have you come so far away sitting in the mountains? We want to detach ourselves from the world. I said, have you successfully detached? Oh, well, sometimes we remember what we left behind. We miss it also. The further you run, the more you miss it. There is no detachment by running away. Detachment cannot be practiced like this. To practice detachment is to get more attached. I tried. I sang a game example of that I was, I went to uh, America and I found some nice pizza there. And I said, I am getting attached to this new food now. I said, there used to be Shakey's Pizza in the 60s. Very popular place, G old Shakey's Pizza. And I said, I am going to detach myself. No more pizza, no more pizza. The more I said, the more pizza came in front of me. It's natural. The more you try to detach yourself, the more attached you get. They know me out. So nobody can practice detachment. And what is the solution? Solution is a new attachment. Pizza Hut came, I forgot Shakey's. <laughs> I said, now I don't even remember, I have to remind myself to, to be able to tell the story. If your attachment is with one thing, 
and something more pulling comes up, you are detached. Great master used to give example of the Indian young girls playing with dolls. And they loved their dolls, the girl, they are living beings. They would cry for the doll, they would take care of the dolls. The dolls were just toys. But the little girls loved their toys so much. And when they got married, I must pack up my dolls also with me. In the dowry, give me the dolls also. And once they grew up, they had their own children, and all remained locked up in the suitcases. They detached to the dolls came only when another thing can pull them. Therefore, the only real way to get experience of detachment is a fresh attachment. This is one of the main functions of having a perfect living master whose love is such that when that love pulls us and becomes strong, the other attachments fall off by themselves. And that's one of the purposes why love is so important that the perfect living masters give to us. So this is the way that detachment comes, not by practicing detachment. So new attachments inside automatically detach us from outside. When new joys and pleasures come inside, there's so many more than the world has to offer here. Automatically we get detached from outside. There are so many attachments inside that we are able to detach from the world, but we get attached to those then. The very first stage of the astral plane has such attractive things there. Of course, besides attractive men and women also, there are other so many attractive things there that we do not move forward in spite of the call of our masters. He said, please let me enjoy this more. I have never seen this kind of heaven before. Let me stay. What do the masters say? Okay, enjoy. At least you have left that place where you were tied up again and again, the physical plane. You are now where you will just move up and not go down. Therefore, take your time. Perfect living masters, disciples, some of them are sitting for a thousand years. And you can see them if you go there. It's amazing how the attachments can then hold you back there also. And then still higher experiences that break those attachments. It's a continuous process that you lose your attachments by getting something better to be attached to. And ultimately it's the pull of the perfect of master love at every stage that takes you back to your true home. Today I'm winding up this meeting here because I know that so many of you have told me that you will be leaving today. I'll be meeting you after, after this lunch break at 3 o'clock and they have arranged some prashad. I want to explain what is prashad. Prashad normally is something blessed blessed by somebody who we respect as a holy person. And the blessing keeps our mind on the holy messages these holy people give us. So when they bless it, we feel we are now thinking of something, we eat that prashad, we remember that holy person. Traditionally, great master used to give puffed rice as prashad. He gave puffed rice, it had a longer life, we could keep it for a little longer time. And so he would distribute with his hands and I remember we took our shirts out sometime or some handkerchief we had, if we afford a handkerchief we could take a handkerchief. Ladies would also put up their scarves, something he'd take the shawl. Now of course we are living in a very comparatively richer society, people can afford to give in little bags, pack up in advance, don't have to pull your shirts or your scarves anymore. Mm -hmm. They are arranged, I believe, that uh, our host, Deepak and Jashri, have arranged that uh, prashad for us. And normally, because of the larger size of the crowd, of the audiences I am now coming across, we just distribute it.
on rare occasions i have got the blessing of great master for their prashad and i give it myself now i know you if you have given a choice would you like that i bless the prashad and distribute it to others or you want to take it from my hands those from my hand raise your hand those is in favor of distribution there no word much okay now this is a very special opportunity for me and i'll be willing to sit with you and give the prashad but please uh, move fast little fast so that other everybody gets a chance to have this because if the time we have set for the prashad is over then others will have distributed by this for the same other so something so if you move fast everybody will get a chance to come to me and uh, receive it from my hands prashad everything can be prashad my father was also a disciple of the same great master and great master we had the great fortune would come and stay in our house many times every time he came great my dad used to change the chair there were eight chairs on the dining table he put a new chair for eight chairs became prashad we changed all the sheets we changed the table cloths everything so that everything became prashad he touched us we became prashad it's just prashad means is blessed so we can remember who touched us who gave it it does not mean that the thing object has changed it does not mean that the after rice that we give has undergone a molecular change or something and i'm saying this because many people i remember in india they said the child is sick we give a little prashad we should give aspirin or tylenol or something we give the right medicine prashad doesn't become medicine it becomes blessed food you can give the blessed food also a blessing in addition but it is not something different it's just the blessing of the person who's giving or whose blessing we have received in the prashad now this prashad i am going to give you i'll have the blessing of my master hazur maharaj baba saavan singh in it you cannot see him because he is physically dead but those he initiated for him he is as alive as he was when he was living in a physical body so by being his disciple i can request him to bless any does bless he blesses people who attend these meetings he blesses the prashad so therefore for me it's a very big very big occasion to distribute something being blessed by my master so it is that prashad that i will be distributing to you this afternoon and take it take a little at a time make it last longer because then you can remember this occasion longer we used to be given some prashad and uh, since the same kind of puff rice was available in the market also great master would say if you run short of it and before you get the next batch you run short of it buy when it's little less buy some more like that add it shake it up then you won't know which one the original they all become prashad so he told us a homeopathic method of dilution so you dilute it and it becomes more prashad so this is just a old story that i remember also on certain occasions like bandaras bandara meant that uh, the bandara used to take place in great master's time on the 29th of december that was the day on which his master passed away physically baba jamal singh 29th of december baba jamal singh passed away 1903 so that day was a very special day and great master who was always very cheerful in his house he had a little small little kutia or a little small room which was the original place where baba jamal singh used to stay the house was built around it and that was kept locked on bandara day he would go open and spend time remembering his master two times it was my luck that i happened to be there he took me also into that kutia and first time i saw tears in the eyes of great master remembering his master tears of 
remem remembrance of the love and devotion that he had for his master. Very touching scene. I've never been able to forget that. So a very important day for him, 29th December. That's the day he also used to give the prashad with his own hand to people in early days who could come. And so it meant so much that particular day. So on the occasion of the Bandara, now that we have on 2nd of April, the day great master passed away. Bandara is mean, Bandar means abundance. Bandara means celebration of abundance. So we are celebrating the death of a person and calling it Bandara. It doesn't make sense to most people that a person has died whom you loved and you call it a celebration of abundance. How can that mean abundance? <coughs> well, it means abundance for those who in, were initiated by him and those who thought he is dead, he becomes more alive for them. And the grace is so abundant in that experience that a perfect living master will never die for his initiates, will always be with that initiate. You can see the, see the perfect living master to start with inside, afterward even outside. And you can be driving your car sitting next to you. He is physically dead, but not for the initiate. Is once you establish the radiant form, let me go to the first stage, top of the first stage inside, master will always be with you if he is a perfect living master. Never dies. Therefore, we are not celebrating the death of a person, we are celebrating the abundance of grace that we get it on that particular day. That is the secret of the term Bandara being used for the day when a master has passed away and for the initiates he has not passed away. He has become more accessible. We had to find time to run to the Dera to have his darshan. On 2nd April 1948, the darshan was available to us 24-7. Should we not call it abundance then? Should we not call it Bandara? That's why we called it Bandara. So on Bandara day, I have, I have seen that the presence of great master helping those who assemble is especially great. So that is why people sometimes say that will you give us uh, initiation of great master? I say best day, Bandara day. And maximum grace I see flowing that day. I have never claimed to be master. I don't look like one. I don't function like one. You have seen me so very closely now. But the power is all of great master. I am sharing his teachings. I am just what they call a sevadar, a servant of the great master, sharing his teachings as part of my seva to him. You might think I am doing seva to you. I love to do your seva to you. I am your sevadar also. But I am truly serving him. And this seva I am doing for him is no different from any other seva I have done. I was so, so small, must be seven, eight years old initiated, so small, and there was no electric power in the Dera, so they used to fan the great master with a big fan. So one day I said, I wish I could also hold that fan and fan the great master. That will be great seva. The sevadars were doing it. So once great master was sitting, small group in, sitting in front, I came to the stage and I got up to take the that fan, big fan with which the Sevadar was standing the great master in summer. And the Sevadar said, get down, get down. You're too small to do this. I said, I want the fan. You know, get down, get down. And great master smiled and said, give him the fan. And I remember, I can never forget. I took that big fan. Fan was as big as myself, I think. And I fanned the great master. I enjoyed the Seva. What I'm doing today, I enjoy the same way. There is no difference that one seva is better than the other. Seva is seva. It's important to remember that seva is a very great remedy for our egos. When you do seva, you bring yourself at level with everybody who is doing seva. It's a wonderful way. Our egos are very troublesome for us. But when you do seva as an offering, 
Seva is only seva if you are not expecting a result for it. If you are expecting something in exchange, that's not seva, that's called a business transaction. That's a business that you, I give you this, you give me that. Seva is done with unconditional offering. Seva, they say, is of three kinds. First, seva with the body, like I did with the fan. Second, seva with money, you can donate something. Meetings are held, it costs money. Dera is built, it costs money. Materials have to be bought. So we could do seva, helping carrying a brick with a body, or we could give the money to buy the bricks. So seva with body, seva with money. Third is called seva with the mind. Seva with the mind, very few people do. Seva with the mind means when you meditate with the mind, make it an offering a seva without expecting a result from that session of meditation. Devote that meditation, today is my offering to you. I don't want anything. It's just my offering to you. That seva of the mind. All these are supposed to be seva which allows us to follow another principle which they say is the principle of surrender. When you do seva, you are surrendering something. You're giving away something without expecting a reward. So it's a type of a surrender. So they say surrender is four types. Seva three types, surrender four types. First say, uh, surrender, I surrender by doing seva, bodily seva for you. No, I have surrendered my effort that I put in to you. <coughs> Money I give away, I surrender to you. My meditation session today, two hours, I surrender to you, I give it to you. The fourth surrender is the most difficult. That's called surrender of the surrenderer. I have done the seva first, I have done the seva with money, I have done the seva with this, I still there, I surrender the I also to you. That's the fourth seva, most difficult. But all seva is good, it doesn't matter which one it is. That is why what I am doing is purely seva for my master. It's being done expressly according to his directions. I do not say a single word more than I am required to, nor single word less. It is a seva that makes me as happy as a fan. As a, as a, he asked me other sevas, asked me to see that a, a road permanent, uh, regular road was built from the Dera to the main road. I got that done. I, I had some political cap on my head in those days, so I had some influence with the British rulers. So we worked together and we got things done. Every save I did was equally good. Why I'm saying that? Because I heard recently somebody complaining my seva was very good, it was stolen by somebody. I said, so seva can be stolen by somebody? Yes, somebody more powerful stole and gave me smaller seva. No, there's no such thing. If you get an opportunity at any time, you are followers of masters, many of you, if you get an opportunity, consider every seva to be of equal value. Because the effect of the ego is very similar if you give truly seva. So that is why I always tell people, seva should be done and it has a certain effect on our mind which takes a long time for meditation to create. Seva can create that. I think I've mentioned to many of you the story of an American disciple who came to the Dera at that time. Mitti seva was going on. What is Mitti seva? They had building the they are building the dera and to carry the dirt and the dust and the um, mud for their places on their heads was called Mitti Seva. Everybody did it. We all enjoyed doing that. Our clothes used to get all full of dust. Nobody could recognize who was who. People with beards had all dusty beards. People who were wearing white clothes, they looked dusty clothes. Nobody could know this American disciple he reached the dera and saw Mitti Seva going on. He saw people carrying loads of things, dirt and bricks and whatnot, 
for the building and he called one of these persons. He said, hey, come here. I, I want you to carry my bag. He thought, these are all laborers working here. So carry my bag to the guest house. So he said, yes, sir, yes, sir. Oh, you speak English, very good. So he went, took him to the guest house. He offered a dollar bill to him. He took out the dollar bill. He said, do you know this is American dollar worth many rupees of your currency? It's worth a lot more than your rupee. I'm giving you as a tip. So the Sevada said, sir, I don't take tips, please. No, I don't take tips. No, no, take it. It's, it's, a, it's, a, it's a good way to appreciate that you brought my suitcase to the guest house. No, sir. In the evening, there was a meeting and some uh, close disciples of uh, great master and some foreign <coughs> disciples like him and some others from Africa, from uh, America, England had come there. So this man sat and saw that one man in a suit and tie sitting in the front row looked like the same man who picked up a suitcase. So he asked another person, who is that man? He looks like the one he carried my suitcase. He says, oh, he's a billionaire. He runs his factories in Calcutta. He has got this thing. He's a very rich man. He said, I should have gone to apologize to him. And he said, apologize? He said, what apologies for what? You carried my suitcase. I said, very privileged that I got the opportunity to do seva for you. This is what seva does. It does, takes away our haughtiness. I am bigger. I am bigger than that person. I am richer than that person. Those things go away when you are doing seva. It's a leveler of egos in a certain way. That's why I always say seva is a great thing. And take full advantage if you get opportunity for doing any kind of seva. Try to do all kinds of seva if you can. So this is uh, uh, my request and I'll see you now after lunch at 3 o'clock and we'll distribute prashad here. And then some people have got a pre-screening done for initiations, great master's initiation. And I will look at them again and see if they qualify. If they are ready, then they'll get the initiation today. Thank you very much for listening so patiently to me.